So I want to ask us to jump right into some really hot water together. This is a conversation that a lot of people through the years have wanted me to have. And this is also a conversation that a lot of people have told me, hey, you should never have that. But I know this is going to be an uncomfortable conversation for some over the next few weeks. So I'm asking you to take a breath and hang on because I feel like I have a responsibility to have this conversation now like never before. See, I believe it's my responsibility as a pastor that when things in our culture intersect with following Jesus, then I have to talk about that with followers of Jesus. So if you're with us and you aren't a follower of Jesus or you are a follower of Jesus, but you wouldn't say I'm your pastor or that community Christian, we're not your church, then you're just welcome to sit back and listen and maybe you'll say, wow, I never thought about that. Or maybe you'll say, wow, I'm glad I'm not a part of that church. But if you consider this to be your church, I need you to try and be as open as you can to a very important conversation we need to have together. And before I start, I wanna say, uh, this doesn't mean that we're changing direction or that we're about to become an every week current events church, you know, where every week I look at what's going on and I try to comment on it. One, you're not interested in that. And two, I'm, I'm not near smart enough to do that. But every once in a while, and I'll just say for me, the frequency of this has been, this is like the fourth time in 30 years. So every once in a while, it's time to hit the pause button and say to those of us who follow Jesus, you know, everybody has an opinion about what's happening and what should happen in our world and how we should fix things in our world. You have one, I have one. Oh, and by the way, Jesus has an opinion too. And what's so fascinating is that in this current discussion that's going on in our country, now in terms of politics and the economy and the election and racial problems and the virus and all this stuff, Jesus has spoken into this. So it's my responsibility to bring this message to us for the next few weeks. And if I can make every Christian in our country listen to this, here's what I'd say. Let's not miss the opportunity that's being caused by the disruption of our normal life because it is an opportunity. And in my life, it's the first opportunity of this kind that we have where lots of people in our world have stopped and we're all looking at the same things together and they're things we don't often wanna see. And because of that, the second thing I'd say is, let's not make the same mistake that I've seen us make before with lesser opportunities. Let's not view this through the lens that everybody wants us to see it through. As followers of Jesus, Let's see it through the Jesus lens. And just so you don't miss what I'm saying, the lens that we're being pushed to see it through, the same lens we're always pushed to see everything through. We're being asked to look at everything in our world through the lens of politics. And too many generations of Christians before us in times like these have viewed their faith through their politics instead of viewing their politics through their faith. If we could be the generation of the church in the United States that started seeing our world through the lens of faith, that is, I believe that God is who he says he is and that he'll do everything he said he would do instead of through the lens of, well, my constitutional rights are, and well, we're a country where we always have. Well, that sounds like socialism. Well, that sounds like you're just another right-wing bigot. Because see, if, if the church in this country, I mean, if we could begin to view our politics through the filter of faith rather than the other way around, then we could begin to be the answer to Jesus' prayer when he said, if we would be one, the church would be one, like he and the Father are one, then the world would know that he's the Lord. And from that unity, we could begin to move towards solutions. And for any of you who are listening to this and you're not a follower of Jesus and what I just said makes you afraid because you think it sounds like I just said what a Muslim teacher might say, like we're gonna pass a Christian version of Sharia law and we're gonna have you stone your children when they disobey you because that's in the Bible. Let me just be real clear. I'm not talking about Old Testament law. I'm a follower of Jesus and that isn't him. If you're a Christian in this country, would you just take a breath and say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Trumper, uh, I'm anybody but Trump, I'm an independent, I'm a libertarian, I don't vote, I don't care. But as a Christian, I'm gonna set all of that aside and as much as I can, I'm gonna ask the question, 
What would my heavenly father have me do? What would my savior have me do? What should the church do in a nation like the United States of America if we have the opportunity that we have? Not what's best for my business, not what would be best for my bank account, not what would be best for the causes that I care about. What would God have me to do? I think we have an extraordinary opportunity. So for the next few weeks, to the best of our ability, and I'm sure I'm gonna fall short, but I gotta give it a shot. I wanna help us view our current national situation, not through the lens of politics, but through a different lens. And maybe nobody but us will be impacted, but I believe if we could just begin to see it differently, we'd know what to do. And I'm absolutely convinced that then the change that most of us believe to take place in this country, you know, it's not gonna begin in Washington. It won't begin in some group where we call them the, a them. It's not some people somewhere far away. The change that needs to take place is in us. Because what needs to change in our country is a sense once again of we, the people. More specifically, I think, because this is where the real power of this is, it begins with we, the church. All the great movements that have made this world, the Western world, the way that all of us enjoy it, they've been started by people of faith. Whether we're talking about a movement to rescue unwanted children and orphanages around the world, they started by Christians. Better health care, I mean, go back to the start of hospitals. It, it was the church. Universities and the advances, the first steps directed uh, towards science, it was the church in my lifetime. The step towards made by civil rights for African-Americans were led by people and rallies were held in churches. Of course, the downside is it's often been the church that's held back progress. It's in the needed areas, instead of saying what we can do, we say, they are the problem. But God has called us to move in his power and strength to be about his mission, which is to reclaim and restore the world to the place that he created to be and we destroyed it. And it starts not with a them, it starts with us because he has empowered us and he is with us and he goes before us.
So I wanna call all of us as followers of Jesus to stop viewing our faith through our politics. And I want us to confess that we've done that and pray that God will help us to be the church and put our trust in him first. But I realize that when I say that, everybody who's a follower of Jesus would say, yeah, we need everybody to do that. And the reason we'd all say that is because we don't think we have a problem. The problem is those other followers of Jesus on the other side of the political divide. Because you just heard everything I said through the lens of politics. And some of you who think I disagree with you politically are saying, well, I sure hope he listens to himself and he does what he's asking us to do. And those of you who think I agree with you politically are saying, yeah, go get them. And the very first moment of us trying to talk about this, you've put what I've said either for or against you, not because you can point to something that's against our faith that I got wrong, but because of where you think I might be politically. Because you just heard all of that through your political filter. So we all reach down, we all get ready to get our stones, and some of you wanna throw them at me, and others of you think I'm about to throw them with you at the other side, and just as we're about to start throwing stones, somewhere in the distance we hear Jesus speak, and Jesus says, hey, wait a second. And everybody's like, yeah, I want Jesus to speak because Jesus is gonna support my point of view. So go ahead, Jesus, say something. And we know that after you talk, we're gonna have more motivation and more fuel for our fire. So Jesus comes in this tense situation where everybody's outraged and he's hoping that we'll learn to view our politics through our faith rather than our faith through our filter of our politics. But this is really hard for us to do. And to be honest, I think the older we get, the harder it is for us to do. So Jesus says, hey, wait, before you throw stones at each other, I just have a question for you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Well, that's easy because even though I do have a problem, they have a bigger issue. And when I focus on them, it makes me feel like I'm actually doing something about the problem. Jesus would say, oh, okay, that's an answer. Anybody else? Why do you focus on the sawdust in somebody else's eye, the speck, when you have a plank in your own? Yep, you in the back? Well, Jesus, mine is really more of a statement question. I don't have a plank in my eye. Why do you say I do? Okay, now, that's the right answer. See, the reason I focus on your problem and everything I see wrong in the world is a them issue is because we're all the same. I'm right, and you're right and your politics are right, and none of us are wrong on purpose. No, everybody thinks we all believe we're right. And Jesus says, hey, why is it you think all the problems of our world are out there? It's because you don't, you don't look in the mirror. And so the real answer of why you see every problem in the world as being a them problem is you won't look in the mirror at the plank sticking out of your own eye. And the real answer to why you focus over there is because you don't think you have a plank in your eye. Jesus goes on. How can you say, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? I mean, he just repeats it. In fact, I think he would say, you know how I know there's a plank in your eye? Because you're so focused on the speck in their eye. And then he says, and this sounds so hard to us, so I, I just want you to remember this. This is Jesus saying this, this isn't me. Jesus says, you hypocrite. Now, most of us hear Jesus saying that and we say, we think he's saying, hey, don't be critical of others because you got some issues in your life too. And that's a good start, but that's not really it. And it's not really why he calls us hypocrites. He's saying, watch out as you point your finger at them because you have the same issue in your life. Oh, no, I don't. I'm nothing like them. Jesus, I would think, would say, uh, you don't think so? You hypocrite first. So this is where we're gonna get this right. This is where it all starts, first. Hey, would you like to see our country get better on all these issues we're concerned about? Of course I would. Good, here's where we start. First, take the plank out of your own eye, okay? Okay, keep going. We already talked about that. I don't really have one of those. First, get the plank out of your eye. When something about you bothers me, I need to take a long, hard look at me 
before I talk to you at all, I, I'm just telling you, this would change everything. See, I, I know what Republicans think. You think, how can any thinking person not see what the Democrats have done to our country? W would you just look in a mirror? Democrats are like, Republicans, if, if you can just see you the way I see you, and Jesus is saying to both sides, hey, th that, those are really good ideas. Y you just had the mirror turned the wrong way. First, get the plank out of your eye. If all of us, instead of going home and listening to more of our favorite news or jumping on social media to take a poke at somebody else or post more truth just to help other people out, what if we, the church, said, hmm, the stuff that drives me crazy about those people, is there any of that in me? And, of course, you don't think there is because if you thought there was, you'd already have dealt with that. Jesus says, if it just really ticks you off and it drives you crazy, Oh, that's an indication that you're focused on a speck when there is probably actually a plank. And then he gives this promise. This is a promise for us. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly. This is a promise for you. If we, were the, if we the church would do this, I mean, this is a promise for us. If we will take the plank out of our eye, then we will see clearly. You think if you just say one more thing, you think if you could just post one more thing, then they will see more clearly. Jesus, the problem is that they don't see it clearly. And Jesus is saying, no, the problem is you don't see it clearly. Jesus says, would you like to see it clearly? Yeah, well, go home and look in the mirror. Look specifically for the thing in you that drives you crazy about the other group. Then you will see clearly to take to remove the speck from the other persons. You're like, yeah, I knew they couldn't see. Jesus says, that's right. I mean, they do have something in their eye. Well, you have to start with you because if you keep trying to get the speck out of their eye with the plank in your own eye, you're gonna put your eye out. You won't be able to see anything. So the first step in our process of praying for our country and trying to have a positive impact Jesus wants us to have in our country, the road to change, it begins with me. It begins with the church. It begins with we. It does not start with they or them. This is true of our country, but I'll tell you, it's also true in your family, your marriage, your parenting, your business. The change that has to come starts with me. It starts with we. So how does that sit with you? If you're joining us and you're not a follower of Jesus, I'd love to hear from you. You can text me at the number on the screen because you aren't a follower of Jesus and you can just tell me you aren't going to do what I just said. And The real problem really is out there. It's even with people like me. But if you're a follower of Jesus, our leaders already given us the starting point. And there are enough followers of Jesus in this nation that if we got this thing right, things would change. It starts with us looking at us. In the following prayer, we will read the words in bold together. As we do, allow the Lord to lead you in any areas of your life where these words are not true for you. Now let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Let's take a moment of silence to ask our Heavenly Father to reveal to us any ways in which we are failing to live up to the words of this prayer. Now let's continue to pray. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled, 
as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. Once again, let's listen to the voice of our Heavenly Father speak. Where are you falling short of these words? Now let's continue to pray together. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Heavenly Father, may these words ring true through every thought, word, and deed in our lives. May we become instruments of your peace and love to our world by choosing to examine our own failures and allowing your spirit of love to transform us in the image of Jesus. For it is in his name that we live and move and breathe, and in his name that we pray, amen. So can I help us all begin to see this just a bit? Do you think the problem in this country is that there are so many people that are just wanting something for nothing? They're just greedy. Those greedy Republicans, those Democrats that want to take other people's money and just misuse it. Here's how I want to start for us to see this. If you see this in them, here's what I want you to ask. Am I greedy? You go, of course I'm not greedy. I mean, of course I'm not. But you know what the problem is with greed? You can't see it in the mirror. So let me give you a different kind of mirror and maybe you can use it and it'll help. Does 98% of what you get, what gets placed in your hands, does it get used on your lifestyle and that of your family? Is the assumption you sort of made about your stuff is that everything that comes to you is for your consumption? You know what that is? That's greed. Do you know what would happen in our country? And I've told you this and I've tried to model it as well as I can. If, if you would do as I've done in this one area, not in every area of my life, but in this one area, if you would become a percentage giver, and I want to be real clear. I didn't ask anybody to become a percentage giver to me or to Community Christian. I've said the whole run of 30 years, I, I get maybe you don't trust me saying that you ought to give, so, so don't give it to me. But I dare you to give to some cause that you believe in and that you don't get any control over what happens with the money. If every Christian in this country decided, I'm not going to be the average American and give one and a half percent of my money away. I, I, I'm gonna put my faith in front of my American background. I'm gonna be a Christian first. So I'm gonna give a significant percentage of my money away. Do you know what that do in our communities and our neighborhoods and in our schools? Not because of the government, not because of they, but because we, in our capacity as Christians in this country, I mean, our capacity is huge. Do you pay your taxes or are you stealing from me? Do you file, but you have some kind of rich person scheme where you know, I don't really have to pay, or do you do, you do it the, the working person's way? I just work for cash because I don't believe it's a legitimate government anyway, so I just get everybody to pay me in cash. No, 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 no. If you're a follower of Jesus, you, 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 you do it either way, there's no way to get around taxes. I mean, you hypocrite. You're part of the problem. I mean, Jesus already answered this one. Jesus answered this clearly. They asked him, should we pay our taxes? And, and I bet you already know what he said. He held up a Roman coin, this oppressive Roman government. It had an official sign of the Roman government on it. And he, he said to them, just, just give to them what belongs to them and give to God what belongs to God. Maybe it's time that we all begin to admit that we don't pay our taxes, not because of the Caesar part, but because we haven't given to God our willingness to allow God to tell us what to do because he already spoke on this issue. The problem is not a them problem, it's an us problem. Aren't you glad you joined in today? <laughs> Man, are you taking responsibility for the children that you brought into the world? I mean, you know, men, you brought this into the child in the world with a woman or with other women and you aren't married to them? 
Have you insured those children like you're obligated to do? Are you paying child support to your ex-wife or to the women that had your babies? If you're not and you're a follower of Jesus, you, you hypocrite. And the, part, and the part of the problem in our culture is you can go home and figure this out for yourself. It's, it's all over the internet. The primary cause for poverty, the thing that drives poverty in our country is related to this very thing. And you say, well, I'm middle class and she has a job. It doesn't matter. If, if, if you're not insuring your kids, if you're not taking financial responsibility for your children, you are a part of the problem. You lost it all and all your right to say anything about the problem, about poverty in our country and people misusing money, not because you don't vote, but because of the behavior that drives poverty in our country. That's your plank. You go, well, look, it's really none of your business. It is my business. Your decision and people who make those decisions, they depact all of us. Are you stealing from your employer? You're exaggerating with expense reports, not really using all the hours you have that you committed to them. Hey, hey, what about this one? Anybody listen to me smoke pot? Well, it's not really a, a church issue, Pastor. Do you, do you know what you're contributing to? H has it ever crossed your mind? Do you know why no one's smuggling eight track tapes across the border? I mean, you know why? Because no one in our country wants them. I, I, I mean, I know it's kind of funny, but but think about it, my friends. Look, look. if you're a Christian, I and mean, if you're not a Christian, smoke all the pot you want to smoke. It, it, it's just up to you, and, and you'll figure it out. But if you're a Christian and you're using illegal drugs, you hypocrite. And you have no right to complain about anything anyone else is doing. Not because you didn't vote, but because you're contributing to the problem. You view pornography, and you feel like it's your right, and you're concerned about the future of your own little girls, you're contributing to the abuse of women. You're contributing to the abuse of children. You have a side gig or a main gig or you prefer to work for cash because it can't be traced, so you got no taxes and you take advantage of that loophole because you go to the store and you see someone using food stamps and it makes you mad at them because they're taking advantage of the system. Come on, you're a participant. And what's worse, if you're a Christian, Jesus already made clear every dollar that comes your way comes from your heavenly Father. It's His. Okay, I'll stop. Hey, do you know Republicans, Democrats, they both smoke pot. They both misuse pain medication. Do you know Republicans and Democrats who don't pay their child support and don't take care and sure the children they brought in the world? Do you know anyone that's looking for every loophole in the system and in many cases creating more that aren't really spelled out? Those things aren't political problems. It's not a those people problem. You know where that begins? Can you imagine what would happen if just the Christians began to address just a few of the issues I touched on? If we, the church, would not point fingers at somebody else, but instead, we did what we've been led to do by our Lord. There'd be a whole lot less poverty in our world. There'd be a whole lot less racial tension in our world. There'd be a whole lot less drug abuse in our world. There'd be so many things that would happen, and we wouldn't have to vote for anyone to fix those issues. And most of you, you're smart enough to know that. I mean, they want to be elected so badly, they don't really even care about those issues. They just care about people giving them money. We have some big issues in our culture these days, but those solutions doesn't begin in Washington or in Atlanta or at a local level in the mayor's office or the county commissioner's meeting. It begins with you and me in my home, in your home. It begins at our church. It begins here. It begins now because at the end of the day, we're allowed this to happen. More than that, we caused this to happen by not addressing what we know was going on in us. This has nothing to do with legislation. This has everything to do with behavior. So the road out of this begins with me.
with we, not with they. And if you're a Christian, come on, let's do this. And if we do, here's what Jesus promised. And this is amazing. Jesus said, if you'll look in the mirror and if you'll address the plank in your own eye, I promise, then you'll be able to see clearly how to help other people all around you. And you can make progress. And our progress in our communities, progress in our nation, we'll begin to move forward once again. But it does not begin with they. It begins with me. It begins with we, the church, asking Jesus to help us see what we need to see in us. that's our prayer for this series, that God would start the change with us and help us see what we need to see. For those of you who are followers of Jesus and you want to, we're now going to take communion together. So if you're prepared to do that, would you get the elements you're going to use now? If you're new to Christianity, communion is the time each week when followers of Jesus all around the world remind ourselves of what he did to make a way for us to be right with God. Before we take of it, we're told in the Bible to examine ourselves to see that we do this in a worthy manner. So in light of what we just heard Jesus ask us to do, I wanna take a moment and I want you and I to evaluate our attitudes and actions together, to ask for forgiveness and divine assistance in the week ahead. So would you bow your heads right now and pray with me? Father, we confess that we have sinned against you willingly and unwillingly in many ways. Father, we have failed to love the way that you would have us love. We failed to obey the, the prompting of the spirit that's within us to move toward other people. Father, our attitudes and our thoughts have often been wrong toward other people that you love as much as you love us. Father, in the week ahead, would you help us to see ourselves clearly so that we can become the people you want us to be? Cleanse us of all sin. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat and remember Jesus. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
a strength together. Paul concludes that section. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Now, before we're done today, I, I wanna tell you about something that we wanna ask all of you to do just for this series, Christians in the Age of Outrage. Since this is such an important thing for us to get right, and most of us have to admit that our culture, it seems outraged all the time, I wanna invite all of you to join in a group to talk about this just for the length of this series, just for five weeks, not forever. Together, we're gonna to do some curriculum called Christians at Their Best to go along with what we're talking about on Sunday. We have groups that meet online, so no matter where you are in the world, we have a group for you. So here's what I wanna ask you to do if you're willing to do it, to just join a group for this five week period. So text the word group, just the word group to the number on the screen. We'll help you get in a group and together we'll learn with other people how to be followers of Jesus and how we can best be used in this current age of outrage. In addition to that, I wanna urge you to subscribe to our social media channels of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and every day, we're gonna have a guided prayer time together to open ourselves up to being used by the Lord in this age. So follow us, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, and every day we'll be led together in guided prayer time together. Then join us next week for week two of Christians in the age of outrage.